Try to be alert to the breath, what it's doing right now, and what you're doing with it right now. Sometimes you notice that you're putting a little bit too much pressure on it, or too little pressure on it. Too little means that the mind just keeps slipping. <coughs> too much pressure means that the breath feels confined. It's constricted and placed in a little box and can't get out. And John Lee once compared alertness to a pulley that you can, a rope over pulley that you can pull in either way. And then you pull it towards the breath, see what the breath is doing, and then you pull it back to the mind to see how the mind is relating to the breath, to make sure that things are going well, things are working. And if they're not, you can make course adjustments. Pull back a little on the breath. Change your focal point. Think of the breath in other ways. If you find that the way you breathe is building up tension in the neck, think of the breath coming in the neck from the back to reverse that process. See what that does. Tell yourself that everything you experience in the body right now is an aspect of breath energy. And when you look at it that way, then you can gauge whether the sensations you feel are a breath energy that's flowing well or breath energy that's constricted, that's blocked. And then make adjustments there. This simple exercise of checking the results of what you're doing and being very clear about what you're doing is basic to the whole practice. It's how you develop sensitivity. It's how you break down a lot of the barriers in the mind. Because often we are sensitive to what we're doing, but not sensitive to the results. Or we notice the results, but don't really realize what we're doing causing those results. This applies in all areas of our lives. And sometimes it's simply because we haven't directed our minds in the right direction. Other times it's a little bit more willful. There are certain things we don't want to see. And so we erect firewalls in our minds. We put up stage sets to hide things from ourselves. Part of us knows that we're doing this. And yet part of the mind's agreement is to pretend that you don't know. This way we block off unpleasant things, and most of the unpleasant things we block off are things we've done in the past that caused harm. Sometimes things we knowingly did that were going to cause harm, but we went ahead and did them anyway. And if this is a habit with us, we, those firewalls get thicker and thicker, and the whole problem of ignorance becomes bigger and bigger in our minds. We tend to think of ignorance or avijja in very abstract terms, not knowing the Four Noble Truths, not knowing dependent core arising, and not knowing the deathless. But you can't chip away at those forms of ignorance and, until you've chipped away at the more blatant ones, the mind's habit of dissociating, of having gaps. when you decide to do something unskillful. If you had the sense that the Buddha was watching over your shoulder all the time, it would be harder to do it. And so we erect a barrier in the mind, as if there were no Buddha in the world, never had been a Buddha, no Arahant disciples. And in the world that's left in our minds, all kinds of things are possible. But those walls can't stay forever, they have to come down. And then we spend a lot of energy in putting them back up again. So as we're practicing mindfulness, practicing alertness in the meditation, it's for the purpose of boring through those walls, letting them collapse, and having the equanimity to gauge for ourselves where we really have been skillful and where we haven't, and to learn from our mistakes. As the Buddha once said, one of the signs of a wise man is when he realizes his own foolishness. At least that's the very beginning of our 
quest for knowledge, for our quest to overcome ignorance. And the foolishness there is, again, is not that you don't know a particular Buddhist teaching, simply that you aren't sensitive to what you're doing or sensitive to the results. Here we have this power within ourselves to shape our experience. And yet, for the most part, we use it in ways that cause ourselves unnecessary suffering. This, according to the Buddha, is the biggest danger in our lives. Not what other people are going to do to us, but we, what we do to ourselves through our actions. This is why when he focuses on the suffering and the Four Noble Truths, it's specifically the suffering that comes from craving and ignorance. There's a natural stress in the fact that things change. But the real problem is that we create suffering through our craving, through our ignorance. When it becomes a habit to put up those walls, we get in a position where we can't even trust ourselves to do the right thing, not even for our own good. That's scary. I've told before the story of the, the Alaskan shaman who, gosh, it was, must have been decades ago, was interviewed by an anthropologist about his tribe's religious beliefs. And the shaman went along with the anthropologist's questions for a while, but then finally noted it's not what we believe that matters. It's not that we believe, he says, it's what we fear. That's what matters. And a lot of the Buddhist teachings come right down to this. What is there to fear? It's our own misuse of our power to shape our lives. And his teachings are designed to help us learn how to use that power more wisely. And that means breaking down those firewalls, breaking down those compartments that we create in our mind that allow us to do things that are unskillful. So we work with mindfulness and alertness, trying to be as continuously aware of the breath as possible without any gaps, because it's the gaps that allow ignorance to come seeping in to create those walls, to create those little dark corners where it might seem right to act on anger, where it might seem right to act on lust, to seem right to act on fear passion, greed. It seems right because we block off so much of our knowledge of what's, what's really right. And if it's a habit with us, and as I said, we can't, we can't trust ourselves. We end up doing things that are going to harm ourselves, harm other people. Because we tra create these false little worlds where it seems that karma doesn't matter. We can get away with certain actions. Or it won't matter, we tell ourselves. But inevitably, those walls are going to have to come crashing down, and the principle of cause and effect is going to have to assert itself. And so this make-believe in which we create these walls, in which we basically lie to ourselves and agree to be deceived by our own lies, that's where we have to start our work. And we do that by working on the meditation, working on being sensitive to the breath all the time, as continuously as possible. When we learn to be true to ourselves, then the truth holds no fear, truth holds no dangers. It's when we create make-believe worlds for ourselves, we know eventually they're going to have to come tumbling down. But we do our best to keep them shored up. So in the back of the mind there's a fear of the truth, because we haven't been true to ourselves. When you learn to be true to yourself, the truth holds no danger. The truth holds no fear, because you're right there with the truth all the time. It's like a person who holds to the precept against lying. You don't lie at all, so you don't have to remember what you said to this person or what you said to that person, because you've been with the truth all the time. You've been saying the truth all the time. The same principle works on the inner level as well. If you've been with the truth all the time, nothing that the truth will serve up have, will have caused you any fear, caused you any danger. Because over time you learn to become more and more skillful in how you relate to the truth. Even the suffering that comes from past actions, the pain that comes from past actions, you learn how to relate to that skillfully, without trying to pretend that it's not there, without trying to make too big or too little an issue out of it, but looking at it for exactly what it is. and learning to understand it. When you understand it, you can get past it. You can transcend it. And the understanding requires seeing cause and effect, seeing the res your actions, the results of what you're, you've done, and learning
starting to fine-tune your sensitivity so that you become more and more skillful in relating to the truth, which allows you to be with the truth more and more and not go running off into make-believe worlds. So when you think about the causes of suffering, remember, craving and ignorance are not abstract things. They're habits of the mind, many times willful habits of the mind. We, craving comes from ignorance, ignorance also comes from craving. We, set up these walls in our minds so that we can get away with the things we want to do. But we can't really get away. Which is why the craving and ignorance are causes of suffering. So what we're doing as we stay with the breath is not simply a technical exercise that allows us to bypass a lot of the necessary work in our lives. Actually, it gives us the tools we need in order to do that work. But it has to be supplemented also with a knowledge of what the Buddha taught. You can't simply do a technique and hope that the technique will reveal everything to you. You have to reflect on what the Buddha taught about the principle of action, the principle of its results. Generosity, virtue, all the teachings form a coherent whole. Even the teachings that we tend to regard more as the religious trappings around Buddhism are really integral to the practice. The act of taking refuge, what does that mean? When you take the Buddha as your guide in life, one, one thing it means that you keep remembering him. The word saranat, refuge, is also related to the word for, it's actually the same word for to remember. You try to remember the Buddha all the time. It's as if he were looking over your shoulder or his example is always there for you to reflect on. But this is how true happiness is found, through the way that he did it. And you look at the qualities that he developed. He developed compassion, wisdom, purity. That was the way to suffer. That was the way to the end of suffering. And he left, by, left behind the Dharma as his guide in how to develop compassion, wisdom, purity. Interestingly enough, it's always based on the idea that we want happiness. The idea of our desire for happiness many times seems to go counter to compassion, but the Buddha uses it in such a way to foster compassion. You think about the fact that you truly want happiness. Are you different from anyone else in that? Not really. Everybody thinks the same way. Everyone feels the same way. So how can you create a happiness for yourself that would be based on the suffering of other people? Because they're going to be constantly working towards their own happiness. Your search for happiness has to include your desire for other people to be happy, too. Otherwise, it doesn't work. When you learn to think in this, think in this way, then your desire for happiness doesn't require that you be uncompassionate or unsympathetic. Just the opposite. The same with wisdom. As the Buddha once said, the wisdom consists in asking the question, what will, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? Here the emphasis is on the long term, realizing that you are responsible for the actions that will lead to that happiness, and that you have to be careful not to go running off after short-term happiness but long-term pain. That's a desire we all sincerely have. The Buddha is simply asking us to reflect on it in a way that leads to wisdom, leads to discernment. And it's embodied in those teachings we've mentioned many times, his teachings to his son, and reflecting what you're going to do, your intention before you do something. Will it lead to harm? Will it lead to happiness? If it leads to harm, don't do it. If it looks like it's going to be harmless, then go ahead and do it. While you're doing it, however, check to see if any unexpected results are coming up. At least any unexpected harm, stop the action, change, do something else. It seems to cause no harm, continue with it to the end. Even when it's done, though, you, it's not really done. You have to reflect on the long-term results. This applies not only to your physical actions, also to your words and to your deeds, to your thoughts. It applies to your meditation. Look at your, you intend to stay with the breath. You do it a certain way. Check to see the results. Is it going to cause harm? Is it causing harm? Is it causing pain right now? If it is, change. If it's not, keep going. 
when you kind of come out of meditation, notice the re results of your action, your meditation in your daily life. The interesting thing about these instructions, the Buddha said, is this is the way to purity. This is how you purify your thoughts, your words, and your deeds. Through looking at your actions in terms of their intentions, the quality of their results. If you see that you made a mistake, then resolve not to make it again. This is where the purity comes. That requires not having firewalls up in your mind. It means seeing the the connections between what you intend to do and the results you get, and the fact that you can change if you've made a mistake. So this is how compassion, wisdom, and purity are brought about, by taking our desire for happiness and learning to work with it in a skillful way. This is the Dharma. This is how we take refuge in the Dharma, remembering these principles and actually putting them into practice. So the qualities of the Buddha and the Dharma the Buddha appear within us. That's where the, the example of the noble disciples, the third of the, of the Triple Refuge, become embodied within us. That's how we become noble disciples as well. And that's when the Buddha, the Dhamma, and Sangha become a totally internalized refuge, which is where the refuge is really secure, which they all become one with no dividing lines among them. Because at that point the mind becomes one with no dividing lines inside it. Wisdom, compassion, purity all come together at that point. So we talk about divisions or lack of oneness in the mind. Again, it's not a simply conceptual thing. These divisions we create through our willing ignorance, those firewalls we put up in our mind to deny that we've done certain things or that certain results have come about. So you learn to take those down through a relentless honesty, relentless mindfulness, relentless alertness. The compartments of the mind which would allow us to do things that are unskillful, which would mean that we can't trust ourselves, those get torn down so that the mind that's truly one is a mind that can trust itself totally. There are no hidden corners. Everything is wide open in a mind like that. We gain release from the barriers that we create for ourselves, release from the suffering we create for ourselves. When those barriers and that suffering is gone, there's nothing to tie the mind down, nothing to weigh it down. So when we're looking for the freedom and the release and the the Buddha talks about this is where we look, learning to see through the barriers we create for ourselves. It's right here to be seen, simply that we have to learn how to stop creating those barriers. It's a demanding path, but at least it's a path of possibility. You don't have to depend on anyone else. You don't have to be afraid that other people are not going to do the work for you, because all the work is work for you to do. And the more you tear those barriers down, the more you can trust yourself to do the work properly.